Today and right now, I'm really excited to hear about uh, the research that Floor and Chris's uh, team has been working on as part of the collab over the past six months to find out if AI can help us put the power of our archives in the hands of our journalists. Spoiler alert, the answer is yes, but they will tell us more about it very soon. At journalismai.info in the collab page, you can already explore the full uh, study that they published. Uh, and I strongly encourage you to go uh, check it out. And the team will share the direct link also on uh, Telegram and YouTube in the next uh, minutes. So this is it for my introduction. I'm so, so happy to be here with Floor and Chris and introducing them very uh, soon and hear about their amazing work. I think we're starting with Floor. So Super. Hi, can you listen to me? Uh, in today's session, uh, we are going to share with you uh, what we have learned about if AI can help us to put the power of our archives in the hands of the journalists. Uh, I'm Flor from La Nación Argentina and Chris Hecket, who will be with me from Altinget uh, in Denmark. Uh, he's the captain of the team. So, now you're going to meet him afterwards. So in our group, uh, we get to work together, uh, different type of media, Altinget from Denmark, Archan from UK, Axel Springer from Germany, La Nación Argentina, Nisma Tan from France, Reuters Global, RTVE, uh, Spanish Television, South China Morning Post uh, from China, and TX Group from Switzerland. And we met sometimes twice a month, and in the last month, like weekly, with Sebastian, David, Mommy, Tim, uh, Patrick, Melissa, Sophie, Nick, and the presenters of today's session. No? So we wanted to, to share their nice faces with you. Uh, we used to see each other in a Zoom <laughs> screen. So we are going to give you a little intro. Uh, we are going to talk about the possibilities of using AI in the archive, the constraints and limitations we have found, uh, different technical approaches, responses from IT companies, and a conclusion. So Chris, you go now. But, uh, so many people are interested in this strange little niche of uh, automatization and AI and journalism. Uh, this uh, collab team started uh, already in spring, so it has been a long journey already. And uh, after the initial uh, ideation phase where we discovered different things that we thought could be interesting to, to research on uh, concerning AI and journalism, uh, we, started, we, we listed uh, our ideas um, and made a survey that we uh, send out to our respective newsrooms to identify what, what is actually most interesting for the journalists that we, uh, that we work more on. And um, uh, we had two winners there, you can say. Uh, and uh, the first one was uh, to uh, how to automatically, automatically suggest the related articles uh, in different ways from the archive. So arch archive-focused um, uh, tools. Um, which we then are going to look at uh, in the session. Uh, and number two was uh, automated CEO headline suggestions. Um, that is, was always also very, a lot of uh, the newsrooms that was very interested in that. Uh, so we actually digged a little more into that as, as well. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, we continued to work with, uh, with the archive and, uh, and made a lot of um, uh, interviews and uh, research on this after uh, after this, that. Um, but uh, Flora, uh, you can uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, option number two. The core yeah. of our collab, but we think it's interesting for you to get to know these actual uh, experiments or, or projects in Shipstead and Axel Springer. Um, where they, uh, for example, in Axel Springer, uh, they try they automated CEO friendly uh, header suggestions with Sebastian Molbeck. You you will can see a 
super detailed explanation in our blog post, but they have um, they have managed to um, train uh, make a database train uh, uh, training with more than 500,000 articles from Belt. Uh, so uh, the model of the algorithm could understand titles and uh, texts uh, in Axel Springer. And um, what I consider super interesting of the shift step experiment is that beside uh, suggesting uh, editors uh, CEO friendly headlines uh, of new articles, they were also trying to work with historical uh, articles that they haven't uh, been titled uh, with a CEO friendly uh, way. No, so um, Axel Springer uh, project is uh, ongoing um, and shifted. No, they put it down because they didn't reach the 80% of accuracy that they were waiting for. But uh, those projects are super interesting. Uh, regarding the possibilities of AI in the archive, um, we deliver, um, uh, we brainstorm a lot about how can we leverage our archive articles, what kind of tasks are possible to solve with AI. And not only AI is needed, but also uh, humans in the loop. And then what kind of solutions are out already there? No, Chris, all yours. You can say we decided to work on the, on the archive, uh, but soon realized that uh, there's really a lot of, of, of possibilities uh, here uh, when working with, uh, with, uh, uh, with AI. Um, so it uh, really also depends on what newsroom you're working in and uh, uh, what kind of uh, need you have. Um, so we tried to map this. Uh, we made a, a very big and complex Miro board, uh, an online uh, uh, whiteboard, uh, where we tried to map it. Um, and uh, we tried to divide it into uh, the different phases of the journalists. Uh, so for example, uh, when you look at the, the ideation phase, um, you have a uh, possibility to detect relevant or evergreen articles uh, that you would like to resurface, um, or you could uh, detect relevant um, evergreen articles that you could use as news leads, uh, articles that you want, want to make a follow-up or, or use as inspiration to news stories. Um, and later on, um, when you already have uh, already been started to write your, your article, uh, you can identify um, evergreen components, for example, facts, box, or backgrounds, uh, documentation, different kinds. It could be also media and so on, graphs and so on. Um, and uh, also in this phase and even later, uh, for the ornamentation phase, for example, um, uh, to suggest uh, you could use it the AI to suggest uh, stories that stories that are based on. Um, uh, yeah, but for, for example, for, for when you want to do some research uh, or to do interlinking um, uh, to, to get to know what, what is already written on this topic before uh, and how should I um, uh, relate my articles to, to earlier um, uh, content. Um, so what we actually try to do is to, uh, to, to embrace all these kinds of, of needs and, and possibilities uh, uh, in our common solutions, that, and uh, that solution, we, we actually gave it a name. And uh, what was the name for? So, I think it's uh, this one. Okay. Here we go. So, we wanted to to develop a tool, a universal tool for all newsrooms, and um, we didn't. Uh, get to that point uh, we have to 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 work in a catalog of solutions uh, because now we're going to explain why but we baptized uh, our robot our search engine for archive content archive and that recommends the best match in the archive uh, for a journalist when he's writing a new article and the three purposes are to reuse uh, previous content to inspire or interlink. No? Uh, based on natural language processing, 
but also maybe in other AI solutions, for, for example, could be computer vision for photographs, no? And that would assign a score or rank to narrow the match. So that was uh, the product the description of uh, the tool that we would like to develop if uh, we had a little more time or a little more resources as well. All right. But <laughs> we found some constraints and limitations uh, rather soon in the collab efforts. And the first one, the most important, is the language barrier. Uh, uh, AI is mostly trained uh, algorithms, models in English. And so there are more uh, libraries, tools, and um, training data in English. Uh, and in our team, we have speakers of German, Danish, Spanish, no, and there is no universal tool for one language, then uh, that was one of, of the limitations that we couldn't develop during these six months, our robot. Uh, another constraint was the newsroom culture, uh, how difficult it is to try to make journalists embrace change, technology, uh, and also, uh, for example, with manual tagging, no? Uh, to have consistency in tagging, sometimes journalists start, but then stop. Uh, and in our survey, uh, the results that Chris showed you uh, before, like they classify themselves, the journalists with that answer, like curious, pioneers, conservatives, and in the free text box, like there were like lots of different approaches to innovate with technology, no? So that was a constraint also. Yeah, you can really see that uh, that some journalists are yeah, embracing the technology uh, in another way than others. Um, so that's that's really uh, uh, something that you have to work with as well. Another limitation was newsroom specific aspects, and that's because uh, in the team we were like legacy media, regional and local newspapers, TV from Spain, B two B project. Uh, news agencies like Reuters. So like uh, we really have different focused, uh, focuses uh, on, on the needs for our specific newsrooms now. Uh, and also something to take into consideration is the individual routines of journalists. Because some work in a Word document or in a Google Doc and not in the CMS. And if we prepare an AI solution that will pop up while you write in a CMS, but the journalists are accustomed to work in other um, software before, so it's not happening. And finally, the resource question, no? Uh, if you have to develop this, uh, you need uh, money. And depend. usually, uh, these uh, investments are more focused on uh, business solution, business intelligence, insights, uh, more for the commercial department, subscriptions. Or, and so it's difficult for media that is based only in advertising. Um, to have a funds to develop this kind of solution. So Chris, tell us about Evergreen Definitions, what Ooh, we found. That was a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, this is a slide from our mirror board as well, uh, where we tried to map the definition of, uh, of Evergreen. And uh, yeah, the short word is that it's complex. Uh, it really depends, again, what kind of newsroom you are, um, and even newsrooms that that uh, are alike, they also have different uh, ways to, to define how they they uh, they uh, define uh, Evergreen um, and how they use it. Um, if you take the next slide, we uh, we try to make uh, like a overall uh, definitions of, uh, of of how to define it. Um, and uh, you could basically make these four categories. Um, uh, the first one was the definition by content, content type. Uh, I think most newsrooms had some kind of definition like this, where it could be pro portraits, reviews, recipes, backgrounds, uh, or the, it could be parts of an article like, a, like an, uh, a graph or a fact box or explainer or something like this. Um, the next definition was what we call the cyclic definition is uh, 
only applicable for some newsrooms, at least in our, at our team, uh, for example, local ones, uh, and ours as well. Um, it could be like uh, when it's uh, summer, uh, articles like how to treat your sunburn or um, how to keep your apartment cool. Uh, or um, it could also be like uh, the story behind uh, Easter traditions or something like this that you can re reuse every year or just update slightly and then uh, resurface it. Uh, or like uh, based on anniversaries, like if one year after the election or in, an important reform, this could be uh, interesting to follow up on that. Uh, the next one is the more the, the contextual uh, definition. Um, and we'd find this as, uh, you don't have to, uh, to s skip slide yet, I have two more definitions to, to talk about, uh, if you can go back. Uh, there's the, con the contextual de definition. Um, uh, which we defined as uh, former articles that uh, somehow uh, support your story. Um, for example, it could be articles about uh, negotiations that finally leads to a reform. Uh, then when you write about the reform, the articles on the negotiations would be what support the article. Uh, or it could be uh, a lot of uh, articles about car crashes, for example, and we, you are write, writing uh, as a, a broader article that de defines a new trend in car crashes. These other articles will be supporting the story and then will also have some kind of evergreen element. Um, and then uh, the more uh, also very broad definition of, uh, of evergreen is the metric, de metric definition, um, which more, is more about uh, sustained engagement. You can see on the traffic numbers uh, that even after one month, for example, you st still have a lot of uh, conversions and and uh, and traffic, um, uh, so that's also. But but everyone have have different uh, standards, like how how many, uh, uh, how much traffic should it be, and after how long time, and so on. Uh, so I, that's also very newsroom specific. Specific. Um, yep, I think that's more more or less that. Uh, yes. So uh, <laughs> with all this. Uh, uh, on the table, uh, we tried also to to look at the, how should you match in, uh, your, your your stories in the archive, and um, yeah, there are many ways to do that, uh, and uh, they're good and bad, and probably a combination is might be the best way. Um, we started with a very basic model, uh, which would basically be to uh, implement your search engine uh, straight into the article uh, uh, template in your CMS and uh, uh, and then you can search the archive uh, already before you start to, to write on the article. Um, then, then we also talked about that the, the search engines on new sites often are not in a very high quality, so you might actually want to have a, a, a Google, uh, simple Google um, uh, search engine, uh, for example, the Google program, program, programmable search engine at the uh, implementing in the CMS, um, so you can find your old stories through, through that. Um, but uh, we would like to be a little more advanced than that, and uh, for example, have uh, the beginning of your new text, you have maybe written the first 50 words or the entire text and you copy that into the CMS. And then, then uh, you would like to have, uh, have some suggestions from the archive uh, based on that. Um, and uh, here we were looking at first, for example, take uh, your tagging system, how many of the words in your text matches uh, or which one matches the, the most uh, text in the archive. Um, here we have uh, a challenge that the uh, tagging is very inconsistent, uh, especially the manu manual uh, uh, tagging. Um, but uh, one interesting thing what you could do was also to uh, to add uh, an evergreen tag. So you actually have when uh, journalists are working on a story that they consider have some kind of evergreen potential, you could give that tag uh, that would also help. Um, but of course, if you have the chance to automate this process, uh, you will be more accurate. Um, uh, but maybe, yeah, the, the, the mix between the automatic automatic way and, uh, and manual would be preferable. Um, well, this leads, leads us to the more IA-based methods. 
for example, using uh, um, uh, make uh, tag libraries based on, on machine learning that is trained on your archive uh, will it enhance your, your matches. Um, uh, on top of that, you could use all the variations of uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. Um, we learned about the Facebook uh, research developed uh, algorithm called Starspace uh, that uh, very shortly com compares the whole the entire text instead of only uh, the words. Um, and uh, some have very good experiences with that, um, but it's also depending on how you work with this. Uh, also have some uh, both both pros and cons depends on the situation um, and then of course uh, natural language processing uh, you can use named entity recognitions uh, word ve vectors and so on and finally also stati statistical uh, approaches are used for example the tf idf uh, method um, so basically there are very many ways to use that and i'm not sure that we haven't met the, the right way of doing that and i also really think that it depends on what kind of newsroom uh, you are and what kind of needs you have uh, uh, yeah um, uh, what kind of matches are you looking for um, but we'll really return to that as well um, finally there's also uh, the explorative uh, model where you combine the the um, matches of by AI with some kind of uh, uh, manual filtering afterwards that you can increase your matches uh, and, and uh, make them um, uh, more accurate and find what you need in the archive. All right, uh, I'm not an, a, a technical expert, so uh, yeah, let's let's go on. Collected uh, some examples, case study from a. Uh, data hygiene requirements for natural language processing at our chant evergreen management at culture strip culture strip uh, is uh, um, led by one of the, the coaches of of by anna hamiskova from the collab and then we have evergreen tagging at nismatan evergreen transformation at reuters and application of tags at tx group to make articles easier to to search. So let's start with UK, Archan, Chris. <laughs> yeah. I really think that these uh, case studies uh, helped us a lot. Uh, and also to discover that our own team members actually had really, really interesting and, uh, and helpful uh, experiences. Uh, and I think still it, it took some time during the process to discover each other's uh, uh, very interesting uh, and uh, important uh, experiences here. Uh, so. I'm very proud of to to have these uh, nice uh, uh, case studies in in our final product. So I'll just go through uh, some of them uh, very briefly here, and of course you have to read our uh, our study uh, to be more clever. Um, but um, yeah, uh, first we we would like to present um, uh, Nicholas Cameron from the Argent uh, wrote uh, this small. Uh, introduction here about the uh, metadata hygiene and uh, it's actually really important to to think about this when you want to apply AI to 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 uh, leverage your archive um, and what that what does that mean uh, basically it's just to to make sure that your metadata metadata in the archive is in, is in place and readable for uh, for um, uh, AI processes um, for example um, uh, first look at the, 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 the standard metadata as a tax uh, word count, uh, publication mod modification date, uh, dwell time, um, or it could be how many en enrichments do they have as uh, graphs, uh, fact boxes, uh, amount of references, names and sources, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, and, and these kind of um, uh, metadata can help you classify the value of the content uh, and that could be for example I don't want to have any matches that have less than 50 words or whatever it could be I mean that it, it, it will help you get uh, more accurate uh, matches when you work with um, uh, AI later on um, this you can combine as well with uh, performance data of course um, uh, traffic from uh, search engines or from social um uh yeah you, you know the, the metrical uh, definitions of, of evergreen um and 
yeah, if, if, if these metadata are probably organized in the in the database, um, uh, it's much easier to apply NLP and and uh, and uh, have a better out outcome. Um, and of of course, another there's another better benefit from the metadata hygiene is that uh, it's possible uh, for you to also uh, have have, uh, have have better ways to to track your your performance of the content um, historically, uh, and this is. Um, uh, could be, for example, through business intelligence tools, and uh, this is the, the slide here is one example of, of that, where you you, you list uh, the performance, and you can see that over time how how your content performs. Yeah, uh, that was Archant. Uh, then we also talked to uh, Culture Trip, uh, Ruben, Anna, were really helpful to and open uh, to to tell us how about how they they work. Um, and this is really a showcase of, of how to, to use evergreen content. Uh, it's a, a culture trip is a travel startup uh, that is actually based on content. Uh, and uh, the content is entirely evergreen. It's uh, around, I think it was around 80,000 pieces of content. And uh, that's basically no news. Uh, you have just go and, uh, and uh, explore the, 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 the big archive uh, when you're a user. Uh, so, uh, uh, what they do is to have very strict metadata hygiene, uh, like I, I described before, uh, and also a very strict uh, taxonomy of tags. Uh, and this uh, helps them to be able to uh, auto index, uh, auto, do auto tagging um, using the star space uh, algorithm that I mentioned before. Um, and uh, this indexing has around 90% accuracy, uh, which is quite good. But it also requires that your metadata hygiene and, uh, and taxonomy is very strict. Uh, but it's very interesting because um, uh, the entire iCRIV is, uh, is, is available and, and uh, active all the time. Uh, so it's really important for them to be, uh, to be alert uh, if something changes uh, and uh, um, the articles have to be be up to date all the time uh, and requires a lot of uh, maintenance. Um, so uh, yeah, you can say evergreen content is only evergreen as long as it's not expired. So uh, um, they built what they call it the the maintenance machine um, on the right here on the screen, um, and uh, it's uh, it's it's scanning the metadata uh, of the articles, looking at if if something changes um, and uh, they then uh, rank it and categorize it so the most needed uh, articles are on top uh, which needs, needs attention and then they can look at if should this article retire or should it uh, should it be up, updated for uh, uh, for future use um, and i think this is really interesting way to to handle uh, evergreen content um, might be difficult to uh, apply it straight to a, a news uh, organization, but uh, I don't know why not. Um, yeah, that was that. Flora, you are muted. Uh, it is. Uh, wait. The floor is yours, Flora. Yes. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> I don't know why I'm I'm muted. I'm still muted. We can hear you now, Flora. Go ahead. No. Okay. I'm so uh, France. Let's travel to France. Uh, Sophie Casal from from our collab share with us this tool that they have developed. This uh, this is their CMS, and you can see at the right that there is a tick box called recyclable uh, that a journalist should uh, check if he considers that the new novel article and uh, the new article uh, is evergreen and they started with this project in 2016 and what happened was oops wait <laughs> uh, what happened was that journalists started to to check it but then uh, abandoned uh, so they didn't have consistency on 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 this. Um, they they have around the ten percent of their content would be evergreen without any update, and twenty percent uh, with uh, some update would be also evergreen. 
and they discovered why they were interested because they discovered, for example, an article that was 30 reasons why not to go to the Côte d'Azur. Uh, they have uh, 100,000 views the first time they published and a month later, uh, they have 200,000 views and then they republished 10 times. And they had other articles uh, that performed super good, like uh, why we can see the coast of Corsica from Nice and what is a red weather warning. Uh, so um, yes, for they consider interesting to have this kind of solution with the eye due to the inconsistency of the journalists to, to check the box. Uh, and what they share in the post, you can read it there, is that the ideal thing would be to have a dedicated person from documentation or archive to uh, check these articles, but they don't have a designated um, person to this, no? So uh, I think that this Matang would definitely um, make good use of an AI solution because they have a 20% of content um, ready to be reused. Let's go to Switzerland now, Chris. <laughs> Let's go to Switzerland. Yeah, uh, yeah, we'd like to finally this show this uh, showcase from uh, TX Media, uh, where Tim Nana, he has uh, written a very, very nice uh, explanation uh, in our case study. And um, uh, yeah, I don't know what, if I want to talk too much, too much about it. I think you should read the article. Uh, but I think he's the one from the team that is closest to uh, to develop what what we're actually trying to 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 find a solution for, and um, uh, it's it's basically you can see on the screen here it was one screenshot of of, of uh, the project. I don't think it's it's fully developed yet, but uh, it it looks quite good. Uh, where they applied an auto tagging system that is supplementary to the to the manual tagging um, and the auto tagging system is based on uh, named entity rec recognition uh, and different algorithm algorithms. Uh, so you can with, you can see in the top you have one um, uh, article about the the White House I think and then you can see the which ones are mostly related. Uh, and the good thing is also that apart from the these tagging systems you have also the, the feedback loops you can say see if the the, article, the journalist can go and see if okay this uh, article is not not interesting or the the match is irrelevant for example and it, it will give a score as well um, so there is a lot of, of interesting uh, uh, experiments in in this project uh, that you should definitely read about um, but I don't dare to talk too much about it it's very technical for me um, and uh, we also have a nice case studies from uh, from Reuters which um, uh, where Patrick is uh, is explaining how they work with uh, with AI and uh, Evergreen and Adwords. Um, yeah. This okay. voting system here at TX Media, and also in in the SEO headlines experiments uh, that we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, they always have like a, a human in the loop, no? Someone that would. Uh, these tools are suggesting uh, journalists and editors, and then they they have the chance to use them or not. Um, and think that that is very important that AI can help, but it's not going to replace the judgment of the journalists. So what happened? We went to CIT companies. Chris, can you tell us? Yeah. Uh, yeah, finally we tried to get in touch with the different uh, IT companies, um, both uh, the bigger ones and uh, startups. Uh, some wanted to talk, some didn't have anything to say, uh, and some had uh, some different ideas. Um, Telefonica and Narrativa, for example, had were suggesting how you could uh, use uh, AI in different ways, but didn't have any um, like any specific project in the pipeline. Uh, so I think actually the most interesting uh, uh, ideas we got was from uh, startups. Uh, I will just mention Spore.ai first, if you can change this to the next slide. Uh, that was what I mentioned earlier about the explorative model. Um, they explained how you can uh, put a text uh, in the left here, 
uh, and then you will have a match on uh, different kinds of uh, related articles in the archive. And yet they, they will also dis uh, display the connection. I mean, open the algorithm and show you how they are connected. And then you could be able to develop uh, the results by uh, clicking on the on the different um, uh, URLs uh, and see, okay, maybe I should have an, some, some, some other persons or entities uh, in, in, my, in my search. Uh, and then you would be able to actually refine your res results by, uh, uh, in an explorative way. So combining the person with the, with the AI, um, I think that's really interesting. Uh, and finally, we, that's still the, the last uh, company we talked to was, um, uh, was Loyal.ai uh, that we actually just talked to yesterday. Uh, and they had, have a really interesting uh, tool as well where they um, work with, uh, for example, when you're writing an article, you can uh, highlight a sentence in, in the Google Doc, uh, and then they will uh, match this, uh, this uh, piece of text with either on social media or in uh, external, like you, you can choose your trusted sources, like uh, specific newspapers, and see what, uh, what matches are the best. Uh, and that will, will help you in your research phase if you like to, to have some background uh, or, or related articles, external references in your work. Really interesting. Uh, and uh, in the pipelines, they are also going to work with, uh, with the article archives. Uh, how they're going to do that is, yeah, I'm curious about that, but that will be in the next chapter, I guess, or report. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, it, it looks really interesting. Um, so thanks for reaching out. Yes. Thanks for reaching out, and they discover us, I think, in the in the journalist and I hashtag at Twitter and start following us. And so they say, "Hey, Chris, look at this loyal AI. Yeah, we should call them for tomorrow, no? So we can." Uh, so that was what happened. And inspiring. we have five. Do you want to say something else? No, I just I... said it was inspiring to to talk to them as well. Yeah. yeah. So um, we have some conclusions and uh, guidelines for using AI in the news archive. Uh, first, to think, what do you want to achieve? What effort are you ready to invest? Think about data hygiene. I have to make a Google search on how to pronounce hygiene. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, the technology. Uh, is your team with you on this idea? That is very important uh, because it can make all the difference of an AI uh, project to be finally embraced by the newsroom if you start working with journalists at the beginning. Uh, and so avoid to lose money and time in an amazing tool that no one is going to use. <laughs> and what is technically possible in your language? Uh, we refer previously about how English is the most developed language uh, for libraries, tools, and training data. But I think that is a question of time that all languages that are interesting, besides very uh, minor uh, dialects, that there is people with like AI for good that want to help those dialects to have training data in their languages. But um, I think it's a question of time. Uh, like we get all the Spanish together uh, uh, and other languages to have uh, good uh, training data and tools in their, in their own language <laughs> again. You can no? also refer uh, to, uh, to David Caswell in the, in the former session where that described how you uh, you have very good potential in, in, in translating uh, from Google Translate, for example, and other tools that translates uh, um, uh, simultaneously. Um, and then you would actually be able to uh, work with other languages um, based on English uh, translation somehow. Um, so I think these kind of tools also work. But I think still the translation from all languages are different. I mean, still you have some languages that are better trained than others, um, as you said, Flor. All right. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions for this. If we are so clear. <laughs> Thank you so much, Flor and Chris, for the very exhaustive presentation and for bringing us across the world also with the different countries. That was really, really cool to follow. Uh, we're starting to get uh, questions both on YouTube and on Telegram. So I. I 
encourage everybody who's reading us there to throw in more and more. We still have a few minutes. Well, we actually have 15 minutes for this part, so that's great. Uh, I will use my privilege of being here and having the mic ready to ask you the first uh, uh, question, which is, if you could tell us, you mentioned about this already a little bit, but I'm curious if you could tell us about your specific experiences in your own uh, newsroom. So like, what have your colleagues been telling as they were following your work uh, and what maybe use cases you see as well, specifically for your own news organizations into using the archive and powered by AI? Should I start? Um, last week we made that another, um... Uh, survey uh, in the in the in our newsroom, and I think it's um, uh, it's really interesting to see how uh, how big variety there are in in method methodology, how how people really work different. Uh, so so I think uh, someone are really asking for yeah these tools would be really great and what a good idea and others will say uh, I've never thought about this and I think it really depends on on, on persons and and routines. So one 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 thing is to how to to streamline routines or just to be better at diplomacy internally in your organization. Like you can do it like this, or this, at our place we do it like this. Uh, so so I, yeah, I think it, it it varies a lot. Uh, I don't know what your experience is for. Can you repeat the question because I was reading the private chat that I haven't read while I was presenting and uh, <laughs> I was surprised. Oh my mic, this it was too noisy. No, <laughs> so. That was perfectly managed. No worries. No, I was asking uh, about potentially in your own newsroom, what your colleagues have been telling you as they were following the project uh -huh. and what kind of use cases can you see for your own newsroom to use these kind of possibilities from the, from the archive? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, it's a possibility and we, we would first start with a quote, uh, project from the team one, like uh, to use text mining to, to find diversity in quotes. No, like you go project by project, uh, but uh, th then we would go, we try to detect the evergreen content explainers uh, for cyclic uh, events, like could be floods, fires. So they used to be very local, but if you have a good explainer of why fires happen always in in summer, or we, we could uh, tweak our algorithm to try to, to surface those um, explainers. And also, I think we could um, make use of news applications, data database-driven uh, applications, that they should be evergreen most of the times. So how to make them um, appear in search engine optimization, and, and because they are very good content that at La Nación, uh, we are working very hard with the data team now. So I think that that's other uh, focus to to think about evergreen content data driven mm. we also have a big uh, use of, uh, of of for example uh, graphs or other like elements of, of articles that you would like to to uh, to reuse and to have a, a, a easy way to identify uh, what is relevant for me uh, in this article so yeah and now we have a, a new no, I'm just saying that I think there is really a big potential in the in the archive to uh, to to re reuse um, content in this way. Yeah. And now we are uh, uh, from the data team, but uh, cross sections in the newsroom with a with a nature project with uh, focusing climate crisis and biodiversity uh, crisis, and those need like good explainers uh, to be. Uh, reuse many times in the coming years <laughs> till we get to the the goals that every country needs to accomplish to avoid the raise of the temperature in our planet <laughs> to be able to continue as a species. So it would be a nice opportunity to make them a very good evergreen content um, explainers regarding why we should care about this and about that, what is the meaning of um, this gas or the uh, 
the transport, uh, how we move and all that. Uh, it could be like an investment to be reused many times in the coming years. Those are some great case studies and the potential use cases actually for future applications. So thanks for sharing for sharing those. That's that's exciting about the potential of this, as you are saying. Um, I have a question from Ben on uh, YouTube. Uh, yeah, on YouTube, and I should be able to put it on screen as well. So Ben is asking if you have any insights in relation to the increase in engagement metrics as a result of using the archive content and maybe linking to archive content in the in the in in the use of the production of news. We haven't metered that at La Nación. Uh, yet for, for this project, but definitely for me, if someone arrives to your content uh, using a social media and uh, search engine uh, uh, and found uh, what he was looking for, and it's um, uh, he will read everything because he was looking for that, no? And if it has a, uh, I don't have the your answer, but it's, I'm thinking more of common sense. If you have good uh, SEO headlines and it resurfaces the evergreen content and someone finds you, uh, he will be delighted. <laughs> Chris, anything to add? Okay, good. So as always, trying to balance the sources of questions and get an answer for all of them to be answered. I will move to Telegram where Lean has a question. Uh, Willina is asking on Telegram, which newsrooms like impressed you the most in terms of helping journalists make sense of the uh, taxonomy around all of this that you were mentioning before? And which players and news, organ news media organization or also tech companies have made uh, automated meta tagging particularly easy for the newsroom among the case studies you encountered? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think we highlighted the uh, culture trip as uh, as very good at the at, at the taxonomy, um, and we haven't been very strict on uh, analyzing every newsroom and comparing them uh, to see how how they they work. Um, so it's I think it's difficult for me to like highlight it. I think also um, Archant is is you, we had the case about uh, data hygiene. They they also pretty far in that. Um, uh, as a part of our team. Um, we haven't included in our report, but we have a long conversation with Parsley. Yeah, and true. that was amazing. Uh, they have a, a blog post uh, signed by Mr. I don't remember his name, but uh, Montalenti. Montalenti, I think, is the uh, founder, co-founder. And he explained how they have worked with NLP and tagging. And that was amazing, no? But we didn't relate it to archive content because they are working like live uh, with live uh, articles uh, on the fly. So, but if if you are interested, the one who asked about this, I would uh, Google that article from the Parsley blog mm. to Fun get up. more insights. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like they have so much data to uh, to uh, to analyze. So it's 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 quite interesting what they get out of it. Good. So that will make sure that I get the link to that article for you so that we can share it with everybody who is uh, listening and following uh, online. I'm uh, I'm going to get another question in terms of like the next steps as uh, uh, this uh, field keeps developing and the technologies keep developing forward. Uh, what is your hope or what are you most looking forward to in terms of like what maybe your own newsroom could do once this becomes more easy and available to use? Uh, I think we have listed some of the, the potentials in the, in the case study. Um, so, I, I, and I think that the, the potentials are many. Um, uh, also, you are going to listen to team three that also working with uh, how to leverage uh, uh, the archive and, and, and uh, make structured journalism from that. Uh, and I think, to, to begin to watch uh, and look at your your uh, archive as a data set instead of uh, lost material or old news uh, you have uh, yeah I think it, you just need to be, be creative to, to find out the, the potential there um, 
um, both in resurfacing and to, to create new, new content. I think that newsrooms in Latin America, maybe Central America, Africa, uh, that we are not in like uh, Europe or United States, it's very difficult uh, to pay for, for um, solutions, IT solutions that are in dollars or euros, so it's impossible for us to pay that. And we shouldn't go solo, but work in collaboration, like uh, I don't plan for La Nación, uh, we don't plan to go solo with this, but try to work with as many Spanish newsrooms uh, and then tweak the nuances of how we how we call a swimming pool with three different Spanish words, depending on what country you are. Uh, or dulce de leche, caramel, uh, it's different names in different, but I think that the, um, the collaboration is so important and then to try to, to, to get to, tools to resurface um, evergreen content or SEO headlines. Um, that's what I think as a strategy for La Nación to work in teams what we can with international newsrooms and then with Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. And I think the potential is not only to uh, to have common tools, but also to to share, uh, uh, you can say methodology, like you can do this or that way and what works, what that, what doesn't, uh, is it compared to build to our newsroom and our needs and so on to, to map it. And I think this, this study is, is a good step on, in, the, in that direction. That's even very... with, even with a low, with not com competitor, let, let's like the tools are very expensive and or difficult in time to even to, to adapt open source to your own newsroom. So uh, let's collaborate in building tools and compete for the stories. Instead, competing stories, but not uh, in trying to leverage these tools uh, in newsrooms around the world. That sounds like a very, very great quote to explain the value of collaboration in general. Thank you, Flor. Uh, I think I'm going to bring in a special guest in the conversation for a comment or question. Charlie, you are on. Hey, Charlie. You're still muted. You are still muted. Sorry, Charlie, you're muted. But it looks like an interesting question. Oh, that's uh, I, I was going to say that um, that's so fascinating and it's so complicated. And I think in many ways that your team, that you know, non, you know I've been watching you for the last few months, um, I think you had in many ways the most complex, and in a way that's the most interesting aspect of it. You know, that not just the fact that you had so many different newsrooms from different places, but I think you were trying to use AI to boost journalism. And of course, making journalism is a very complex and varied thing. So the idea that you can get one tool that's going to fit all those newsrooms, all those use cases. Um, but I, I think what you just said is fantastic, that yes, we absolutely want to compete on the stories, but if we look at these tools or systems, or whatever you want to call them, different people may be able to share the experiences and find something that's uh, you know, relevant to, to them. Uh, and it strikes me that there is opportunities even beyond um, servicing the journalists. It's trying to create or trying to help those journalists create even new products. Um, so it, many years ago, 15 years ago, I worked at ITN. TV news company in the UK, and they made a fortune out of their archives. But of course, uh, they, the, the journalists were using the archives, of course, to make stories. But so many other people wanted to tap into those wonderful pictures that ITN had for all sorts of reasons. Corporate uh, people wanted it, you know, advertisers wanted it, educationalists wanted it. So I think that it's, this is a fantastic journey that you've taken us upon. Um, and of course, the journalists are thinking, can it help us with the news? But I think it taps into the way that journalism can actually communicate across a whole range uh, of, of formats and products. So I'm really looking forward to people you know, taking up the work that you've done uh, so fantastically and thinking creatively about it in the future as well. Well done. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks to you for uh, making this possible. Very, very good. We have about one minute to go, so I'm going to bring in, in the form of a question, another person you might know pretty well, because a fellow collab member, Ole, 
Hello. is actually asking on YouTube uh, if you heard or if you encountered any company picking up audio or video from archives other than just uh, text using AI, of course. Well, Trint uh, use video, uh, then audio, uh, not video, uh, but you have to upload the information. It's not that they have the, the search engine for a archive and uh, you should as newsroom upload that information to to trend and uh, i'm waiting for like google has a in uh, youtube has an api uh, uh, if you upload a video you can turn that in using the the um, automatic transcribing you wait a minute and i have like a a hack and then you can download the text from that video or audio but um it's really like a, a hacking is not that i'm doing to to try to to transcribe video uh, but no we haven't had the solution yet and i hope that youtube doesn't discover me and put down that <laughs> <laughs> We'll make sure to edit part of the video from the final cut. <laughs> All right, I think time's up. We got to the 60 minutes of this session. It was inspiring and we learned a lot. So Floor, Chris, thank you so much for representing your incredible international team. Thanks for sharing with us six months of really intense uh, work in just a few minutes at the end of the day. So that was inspiring. We're really happy that this was a uh, part of the collab this year. And of course, again, for those of you listening uh, on the other side of the screen, make sure to check their work on our website at journalismai.info. You will find the collab page and in there all the links you need to uh, read their very comprehensive study and find out more about the case studies uh, they mentioned in the presentation. So Floor, Chris, we wrap it up here. Thank you so much. Thank you.